Hello again, physics friends. By now, we've seen the non-relativistic velocity addition formula, and we know that it does not work. And many of you are probably thinking, okay, I know how not to do it, but how do I do it correctly? So that's the topic for today, the relativistic velocity addition formula. And we're going to derive the actual general equation, but we're going to do it in two steps. The first step is that we're going to um, introduce a problem with specific numbers and work through the calculations with those numbers. And that should help us build some familiarity with the setup. And then we're going to repeat exactly the same problem, except we'll replace the numbers um, with symbols. And at the end of the day, the solution to that problem will be the velocity addition formula. Um, before we start with um, the derivation of the relativistic version, let's just make sure that we remind ourselves what the non-relativistic velocity addition formula looks like. And we're going to note that there's many similarities between the non-relativistic version and the relativistic version. So here in purple, we have the um, non-relativistic version, which we know is not um, true in general. It only works um, well at low speeds. Um, and here we have the velocity of x relative to y is equal to the velocity of x relative to z plus the z velocity relative to y. Okay. Um, so we'll keep that in the back of our mind. And now let me introduce the problem that we'll be working with. And recall when we talked about the non-relativistic velocity addition formula, we had Alice on a train throwing a baseball and Bob on the ground measuring the speed of that baseball. We're going to do exactly the same problem, except now we'll be dealing with high speeds. And so we'll need to be sure to account for relativistic effects like the um, time dilation, length contraction, and the rear clock set ahead. So here we have our problem, or we have the setup of the problem. Um, I've drawn it in the train frame, and we have the train at rest, and we show the time of the launch and the snapshot diagram at the arrival, and we have this ball that's thrown from the tail of the train to the nose of the train. So that's our setup, right? Alice on the train throws the ball from tail to nose. Bob at rest on the ground also watches. The train moves relative to the ground at 3 fifths C. Um, so we could update our diagrams to show Bob in this frame, right? Bob here is on the ground. There's Bob, but he is moving um, in this frame. He's moving, in this case, to the left at 3 fifths C. And sometime later, the train hasn't moved, but Bob has. Maybe Bob is now on this side of the train. Um, so here we have Bob. And Bob continues to move with the same velocity. Okay, and let's just say that the givens in this problem are that we're told the rest length of the train, 60 feet, and that we're told what the readings on the clocks on the train are at the time of launch and the time of arrival. Those are givens. So, for example, imagine that you are Alice on this train, you're looking at a clock on the wall, and you see that it reads 140 nanoseconds when the ball is thrown, and you see that it reads 260 nanoseconds when the ball arrives. And the first thing to notice is that in the train frame, um, the train clocks are at rest, so they are in sync, and they have the same readings in a given picture, 140, 140, 260, 260. Okay? And the, the thing that we want to then do is, um, in other words, the thing we want to find um, is the velocity of the ball relative to the train. Okay, And then we're going to redo this in the ground frame, and we're going to find the velocity of the ball relative to the ground. Okay. So to solve this, pro um, this question, to find the velocity of the ball relative to the train, it's really a three-step process, right? Culminating with the distance is equal to the speed times the elapsed time. So we first have to identify what is the distance traveled by the ball. Um, in this case, that distance is just the width of the train or the length of the train in this rest frame. So that distance is simply L naught, which in this problem is 60 feet. Okay. The elapsed time for this trip is the time ticked off on a clock at rest. Okay. So let's take either one of these two clocks. It doesn't matter. Let's take the tail clock. It starts at 40. It ends up at 260. And so we can say that the elapsed time is 240 nanoseconds minus one, oh, sorry, 260 nanoseconds. 
minus 140 nanoseconds is equal to 120 nanoseconds, okay? So then the velocity, VBT, is simply the ratio of those two numbers, distance traveled divided by the elapsed time, which is the time ticked off on the train frame. So that's 60 feet over 120 nanoseconds. Well, that is simply one half of a foot per nanosecond, or one half C, okay? So we found the velocity of the ball relative to the train, and we see that it is half the speed of light. And that wraps up everything that we need from the train frame. We're now gonna take the same problem and analyze it in Bob's frame, in the grounds frame. And the first thing that we wanna do there is draw that diagram, so let's do that. Okay, so I've just copied over our diagram from the train frame from the previous slide, and I've now started to diagram out the ground frame, and, and we'll work through that in a minute. Uh, but I did wanna point out that, let, let's see um, why the non-relativistic velocity addition formula just simply can't be right. Okay, so we'll bring that in um, over here. We know that um, the non-relativistic equation is VBG is VBT plus VTG, the ball relative to the train and the train relative to the ground. Um, and we actually just solved for the ball speed relative to the train and found that it was half the speed of light. And the train speed relative to the ground were given in this problem. Um, and we are told that it's three-fifths the speed of light. So if you add those together, you end, you, you end up with a number that's bigger than the speed of light. And we are well aware that that is not possible. Okay, so that's why we get rid of the non-relativistic velocity addition formula and we need something better, okay? So how do we find out the actual speed of the ball relative to the ground? Well, we basically just need to keep track of how far did that ball travel in the ground frame, okay? So it started on the left wall and ends on the right wall. And how much time has elapsed in the ground frame um, for that trip to happen, and we'll do the same thing. Distance equals speed times time, or speed is equal to the distance traveled times the elapsed time, okay? So now we need to start decorating this ground frame diagram to show some relevant quantities. The first thing I will do is make sure that we indicate um, that the train is moving at 3 fifths C, and that's true in both frames, okay? And we can also draw in the ball at its launch position. Um, and the vector we would draw on that is not VBT, right? It's since this is since this is a diagram in the ground frame, the vectors we're gonna draw in here are ground frame velocities. So we'll put VBG there. And that ball eventually makes it to the right-hand wall. And when it does so, that's the end of the trip. And throughout its trip, it's traveling with the same constant velocity. So we can label that velocity there as well as VBG. Okay. Now, what do we know in terms of the clock readings, right? Well, let's look back. We know that when the ball leaves the left wall, the reading on that clock is 140 that is going to be true in all frames, okay? And one way to think about that is imagine that the there's a ball launcher and it's designed to launch the ball when the associated clock reads 140. So as soon as that left-hand clock, as soon as that tail clock reaches 140, out comes the ball. And so that is a frame-independent statement. And the same thing is going to be true that when the ball arrives at the right wall, that clock on the right wall is gonna read 260, okay? And one way to think about that is imagine that the arrival of the ball at the right wall smashes and breaks the clock and stops it from ticking anymore, okay? And the reading on the clock in the train frame was 260. So if that clock is smashed and broken, and we then allow Bob at his leisure to go over and take a reading on that clock, it's gonna say 260, and they all have to agree on that number. Now, these clocks, though, are moving. So the tail clock and the nose clock, they do not have to read the same number. In fact, they will not read the same number because of the rear clock ahead, right? So we're gonna to have to accommodate for the rear clock ahead. We're also gonna to have to allow for the fact that these moving clocks tick slowly 
and therefore the elapsed time in Bob's frame is going to be more than the time ticked off on these moving clocks. So we'll have to account for time dilation. And we also have to account for length contraction, right? This um, rocket is not 60 feet long, right? It's a length L, which is the length contracted version of 60 feet long. And as a reminder, for V of 3 fifths C, we have gamma of 5 fourths. So um, L being L naught over gamma tells us that we have to divide 60 feet by 5 fourths. 60 over 5 is 12, and 12 times 4 is 48. Okay, so this distance, this train length, is 48 feet long. Okay, well, I'm going to outline a multi step process here. Um, and in fact, there's eight steps that we're going to take along the way to compute VBG, the velocity of the ball relative to the ground. Um, but it all comes down to knowing how far did that ball travel, okay, and how much elapsed time, um, how much time elapsed on Bob's clock in the ground frame. So we can show diagrammatically the distance that the ball travels, right? It starts on this dash line and it ends on this dash line. So the total distance that it traveled is this capital D. Okay. And the elapsed time is going to be the time ticked off on Bob's clock. So we can actually update this diagram a little bit. We'll give him a clock. Okay, everybody gets a clock. Okay. Okay, that clock is in the same place. And the difference in the readings on this clock at two different times tells us the elapsed time. And the velocity VBG is simply this distance, d, divided by the elapsed time, delta t. Okay, so what's our eight-step plan then? Okay, so I'm going to write out our eight-step plan. Step one, um, things th this, and these are the eight steps we have to accommodate. Okay, the clock separation is smaller. In the ground frame, um, in other words, the length of the train is smaller in the ground frame because of length contraction. Okay, and we already did that calculation, and um, that was the L is L naught over gamma, and we found that that was forty eight feet. Okay, so that number one is already done. Congratulations to us. Number two is that the rear clock is set ahead. Okay, rear clock is set ahead. Okay, and the rear clock is the left clock. Okay. And it's set ahead um, by L naught V over C squared, where L naught is the rest length separation between the clocks, and that's the 60 feet. Okay. So here we go, 60 feet times the 3 fifths foot per nanosecond divided by the speed of light quantity squared, 60 over 5, that's 12, 12 times 3 is 36 nanoseconds, okay? So the RCA is 36 nanoseconds. What that means is we can decorate, we can, we can write in some um, values for the other clock readings, okay? So if the rear clock reads 140, then the front clock should be smaller in reading by 36. Smaller by 36 means 104. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is just put a little highlight um, in. Well, let's see what color should we highlight it? How about a little bit of a yellow highlight? We'll highlight that region with this calculation um, so that that reminds us that step two allowed us to figure out the reading on that clock. And similarly, if we subtract off. Um, we could also play the same game to get the reading on this clock, um, but it turns out we don't actually need to do that. Uh, but for completeness, if we subtracted, uh, if we added rather 36 nanoseconds to 260, that would get us to 296. So we can write in 296 here as the value on that clock. Okay, 
And incidentally, notice that both of these clocks have advanced by the same amount. So 140 um, becomes 260. So that's a, how many ticks is that? Well, that's 156 ticks. Notice that 140 plus 156 is 296. So each individual clock has advanced by the same amount from the first picture to the second. So that's as expected. And we notice that that is the case indeed. Okay. So the front clock, um, oh, we already kind of did this, but the, <laughs> sorry, the front clock reading, I kind of combined steps two and three. Um, the front clock reading, just to be really explicit, is equal to um, the rear clock reading minus 36 nanoseconds. And remember, the rear clock reading was 140 nanoseconds. We're subtracting 36 from that, and we end up with 104 nanoseconds. Um, and that, in fact, sorry, that, in fact, is what I should have highlighted as yellow because that's where the number 104 came from. Steps two and three are closely related, but they're subtly different. One is computing the RCA, and the other is computing the reading on the clock, and those are different things. Okay. Um, we also know at the end of the trip, and we talked about this already, um, the nose clock reads 260 nanoseconds. How do we know that? Um, well, we gathered that because that was true in the train frame, and that's also going to be true um, in all frames because those are co-located event, ball arriving at wall, clock reading 260, those are happening at the same location, and so they're gonna preserve that clock reading. Okay. So we can take the next step here, which is to say that the time ticked off by the moving clock is um, what is its final reading? 260 nanoseconds. What is its starting reading? 104 nanoseconds. So how much time has ticked off? 156 nanoseconds. Okay, and let's just highlight that a little bit. I'll use red. Okay, that's the time ticked off. And how do we get that? Well, we subtracted these two clock readings. So I'll use that in red as well. Okay. Moving on to number five. What is the elapsed time? And remember, elapsed time um, is the time on a clock at rest in the ground frame. So that's Bob's time. Um, well, there we have to account for time dilation. Okay, so the elapsed time in the ground frame is longer by a factor of gamma. In other words, delta t at rest equals gamma times delta t moving. And in this problem, delta t at rest is delta t bob, which is the elapsed time. That's going to be equal to gamma times delta t of the train. Okay, we know that gamma is 5 fourths. We know that delta t train is 156 nanoseconds. And when we multiply that out, we end up with 195 nanoseconds. So that is the elapsed time in the ground frame. Whew. All right, we're almost there. We've got a few more steps. Um, we now have to identify this. We're trying to get the distance now, right? So we want to get the distance D. And the distance D is made up of two parts, okay? The first part, and, you know, my diagram here is getting a little bit cluttered, so I apologize for that. But the first part um, of the distance is how, um, how long is the train in this frame? We saw that was 48 feet. The other part of this distance is how far, um, how far 
did say the front wall travel, for example. Okay, so let me draw that out here. The front wall used to be at this location, and now it's at this location. So apologies, again, I'm gonna be drawing a little label that kind of goes on top of my diagram here. But this is the distance that that front wall travels, and I know that that is equal to the velocity of the train relative to the ground times delta t bob. Okay. So in other words, to get d, we're going to say the big D, the total distance traveled by the ball, is equal to the length of the train, 48 feet, plus how far the wall traveled. Okay. So we're going to say big D is equal to d wall plus L. And so here we're going to solve for d wall. That's one step of the process. And we see that it's v train relative to ground times the elapsed time in Bob's frame. v train relative to ground is 3 fifths of a foot per nanosecond. Delta t Bob we just found was 195 nanoseconds. And when we multiply that out, we find that we travel 117 feet. Okay, so let's see, let's highlight that. Uh, why don't we highlight that in purple? So this quantity that we're calculating, that quantity is 117 feet. Whew, okay, step seven, we're really close now. Okay, now we can just add those together. The total distance traveled is L plus D wall which is 48 feet, and sorry, this is the total distance traveled by the ball. The ball starts on the left wall, it ends on the right wall, so it travels this total distance, big D, um, which is the length of the train of 48 feet plus how far the wall traveled of 117 feet for a grand total of 165 feet. Okay, so what color shall we use? How about we use the following? Um, oh, I don't know. We'll highlight it in gray. That seems a little weird, but let's give it a try and see how it goes. Okay. And now, drum roll please, for our grand finale, V ball relative to ground is given by, uh, or specifically the magnitude of the velocity, the speed of the ball is given by the distance traveled divided by the time elapsed. And this is these are all Bob frame quantities because we're working in Bob's frame. So what is the distance traveled? Well, that's just D. What is the elapsed time? That's delta T Bob. And we know both of those quantities, 165 feet for big D. And how much time has elapsed? 195 nanoseconds. And when you divide that through, you find 11 thirteenths of a foot per nanosecond, or 11 thirteenths C. Now notice, 11 thirteenths C, while close to the speed of light, is less than the speed of light, okay? So unlike the um, non-relativistic equation, right, so this is okay, versus the non-rel prediction of 11 over 10, C, which is bigger than C. So what we see here is uh, we have a way to compute the velocity of the ball relative to the ground, um, even at high speeds, in a way um, that ensures that the speed of the ball relative to the ground will be less than the speed of light. So we've kind of taken this step by step, <laughs> and it's taken a while, and that's okay, but we've taken this step by step for a specific problem with specific numbers. But you can imagine that if instead of putting in numbers here, we just put in um, symbols, then at the end of the day, we'll have an expression VBG, which is not a number, but is an expression. And that expression is going to be exactly the velocity addition formula that's valid at relativistic speeds. So the next thing we're going to do on the next slide is repeat this process, um, except using symbols instead of numbers, 
In that sense, we are going to derive the velocity addition formula for relativistic objects. So we're back with the same problem again, and we know the drill, um, except this time we're going to do, we're going to use symbols instead of numbers, okay? So we, once again, have in the train frame a ball launched from one wall arriving on the other, and this time, instead of putting in specific values for the launch time and the arrival time, we're just going to put in t1 and t2. <clears throat> and instead of specifying the actual length, we're just going to say, um, we're just going to say l0, which is the rest length. Um, and then vbt is the ball's velocity relative to the train. And vbg is the ball's velocity relative to the ground. And remember, we're trying to find vbg in terms of vbt and vtg, okay? Um, all right, so in the, um, in the train frame, we can basically do the following analysis. We can say that the distance traveled by the ball is equal to the length of the train, because it starts on the left side of the train, ends on the right side of the train. So we know that that distance traveled is L0. We know that the elapsed time is the difference in time readings on a single clock, T2 minus T1, and we'll just call that capital uh, T, delta T with capital T. And then we know that the speed, VBT, of the ball relative to the train is the distance traveled by the ball and the elapsed time on the, divided by the elapsed time on the train. So that is L0 over delta T. That is our velocity of the ball relative to the train. So we're going to copy those two main results, and then I'm going to erase this to make space for my ground frame analysis. But we have our main result is that V of the ball relative to the train is L0 over delta T, where delta T is T2 minus T1. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this, and then we'll repeat the analysis in the ground frame to find an expression for VBG, the ball's velocity relative to the ground. Okay, so now we're ready to shift our attention to the ground frame, and I'm just putting down here the ground frame analysis, and we'll write, we will write out the steps that we need to take. Um, and remember, it was an eight-step plan, okay? We know that the train length is smaller, um, so train is shorter. In particular, the train length is L, and that is L0 over gamma, okay? So when we come to our picture um, on the right-hand side for the ground frame, we can label the length of the train as L over gamma. Excuse me, that's L naught over gamma. Next, we recall that, um, that the clocks are moving, so they're not in sync. So the um, left clock is the rear clock. Okay, um, and so the right clock is behind in time, in terms of the reading on it, it's behind by the RCA amount of L naught V over C squared. Okay, and so item number three is that at launch, at the instant of the launch of the photon, oh sorry, of the ball, okay, the right clock reads, um, it reads T1 minus L0 V over C squared, okay? And which V are we talking about? Well, we got to be quite careful about that, okay? So let's actually write this out. Um, it's behind by L0, and the speed of the clock is the relevant quantity. The clock speed is the train speed, VTG. So the RCA amount is L0 VTG over C squared. Okay, so if we come up in here and write in the reading on this clock um, right up here, the right-hand clock in the first instant of this diagram, that reading is T1 minus L0 V train relative to ground over C squared. Good. So we're getting there. Item four in our 
um, eight-step plan is that the time ticked off on the right clock during the journey, um, or not, the time ticked off on the right clock is the final time, T2, minus the initial time, which we just calculated. Okay, And we're going to call that quantity, uh, we'll just call it T2, for that's T final, and then we do minus T initial. And T initial is T1 minus L naught VTG over C squared. Okay. And we'll continue this up here. That's equal to T2 minus T1 plus L naught VTG over C squared. Okay. Now notice something interesting here. We have this T2 minus T1. That's what we called the elapsed time in the train frame. We call that delta T with a capital T. So we can make that substitution also. All right. And for now, we're going to leave it right there. We'll just, we'll leave it at that point and we'll move on to the next item. Step five is that moving clocks tick slow. by a factor of gamma. In other words, that is time dilation. Um, so elapsed time in the ground frame is gamma times the quantity we just calculated. Okay. So we'll make some space for that. It's equal to gamma times delta t plus L naught VTG over C squared. Okay. So we'll leave that alone for now, and we'll move our attention to how far the train travels. So the train travels a distance that's given by its velocity, VTG, multiplied by the elapsed time. And the elapsed time is what we found in step five. Gamma delta T plus L naught VTG over C squared. And just to be clear, this piece here is the elapsed time that we found in step number five. Okay, step seven um, is the distance that the ball travels. Um, and one thing I do wanna, do wanna indicate on this diagram is the distance traveled by the train Right, so the train used to be, the left edge used to be at that location. Now it's at this location. The distance traveled is number six. Item number six is that distance. Item number seven is the distance the ball travels. Oops. How about I use black for this? The distance the ball travels is equal to six plus one. In other words, um, VTG gamma delta T plus L naught VTG over C squared plus L naught over gamma. Okay, so we're running low on space. Um, I'm gonna make some room in the top left corner and shuffle things around a bit. So here we go. 
Okay, so we've moved things around a little bit. Um, we've labeled the total distance traveled by the ball, the length of the train um, in the ground frame, and then the distance that the wall travels. In other words, the distance that the um, train travels in between the first image and the second. And now we want to simplify this expression a little bit, which is a way to write this length, number seven. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just flip the order of these two terms. Um, so I'm going to have the L naught over gamma first, but for a reason that will become clear later, I'm going to factor out gamma from both terms. So instead of L naught over one power of gamma, I have L naught over two powers of gamma. And then the second term becomes, um, I factored out one power of gamma here. So I have a V times delta T, and then I have a VTG squared times L naught over C squared. So here I have VTG delta T plus L naught VTG squared over C squared. Okay. And I want to focus just on one of these terms, this L naught over gamma squared term. So if we, if we bring that over on the side and we just look at that as a single term in and of itself, um, L naught over gamma squared. Well, what is 1 over gamma squared? Uh, well, remember, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if we square gamma, that gets rid of the square root. That's a good thing in terms of simplicity. And if we invert that relationship, we also get rid of the fraction on the right-hand side. So this 1 over gamma squared is actually quite a nice quantity. It's 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay. So this L naught divided by gamma squared is L naught times 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now the whole point of velocity addition is that there's a lot of velocities in the problem. So when we just say gamma is 1 over 1 minus square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, which v are we talking about? Okay. Well, if we think about gamma as the time dilation and length contraction factor, then it's the velocity of the object that's moving in the ground frame. And that object um, for which we're assigning gamma to is the train, right? So when we say that the length of the train is reduced by a factor of gamma, the relevant velocity is the velocity of the train. So here we want to say, just make really clear that here we're talking about v t g when we talk about that velocity. Okay, so I'm just going to expand this out a little bit more. So L naught minus L naught VTG squared over C squared. And so now look at this. If we rearrange that same equation, we have L naught is equal to L naught over gamma squared plus L naught VTG squared over C squared. Okay. So if we go back um, to our main, the equation that we're deriving, we have this L naught over gamma squared. That is the first term in the circle equation. And look at the second term, L naught VTG squared over C squared. That's this second term here. Okay. So these two underlined terms in red sum up to give you just plain old L naught. So that simplifies our expression quite a bit, actually. Now we have a gamma L naught plus VTG delta T. That's the distance traveled by the ball. Okay, and we'll leave it by like that. And uh, why don't we call it D for that total distance, which we can then label on our diagram. Okay, well, we are super, super close now because step eight is that we want to find the speed of the ball, the velocity of the ball, uh, not TG, VBG, the velocity of the ball relative to the ground, is equal to um, the distance traveled by the ball divided by the elapsed time in the ground frame. Well, the distance traveled by the ball, that's just D, the quantity we calculated in problem seven, or step seven. And um, the time elapsed is 
the quantity we calculated in step five. So actually, instead of writing it as d divided by something, I'll actually write out the steps, um, the relevant steps here. So this is step seven divided by step five. So step seven is gamma L naught plus VTG delta T. And step five is gamma multiplied by delta T plus L naught VTG over C squared. And we can see immediately that there's going to be some simplification. Um, in order to get to that simplification, I need a little bit of space to work here. So I'm going to erase away some of these quantities. And off we go. I notice that I have a gamma upstairs and downstairs, and those are going to cancel. Okay. And um, I am going to multiply top and bottom by 1 over delta t. Okay, which I'm allowed to do because I'm multiplying the same thing on the numerator and the denominator. So here we have VBG, which is what we're trying to find, is equal to L naught over delta T plus VTG divided by 1 plus L naught over delta T times VTG over C squared. Now look at this quantity L naught over delta T. Right, we've seen that before. L naught is the rest length of the train. Delta T is the time elapsed in the train frame. So L naught over delta T is exactly the ball's velocity in the train frame. Okay, So we can make that substitution uh, in the following way. VBT in the numerator plus VTG in the numerator. And then down below... We have 1 plus VBT, VTG, over C squared. Okay, And we're there. This is it. We're there. We have an expression. We haven't really talked through the meaning of it. So on the next slide, I want to get back to this value, this quantity, and explain um, some highlights and some aspects of it. Okay, so here we go. This is the quantity that we derived. This is the expression for relativistic velocity addition. The ball's velocity relative to the ground is given by the sum of the ball's velocity relative to the train and the train's velocity relative to the ground divided by a quantity that involves the two velocities in the numerator and the speed of light. Now notice that this numerator should look awfully familiar, right? VBT plus VTG was the non-relativistic velocity addition. And that was how we calculated VBG. Okay, and notice VBG is equal to the non-relativistic expression in the numerator, but because of relativity effects, we have to divide by some quantity in the denominator. And when we divide by that quantity, we're going to reduce the overall speed. And it's this denominator that's going to prevent us from exceeding the speed of light when we add quantities together. Okay, So in a subsequent video, we're going to actually put in numbers for this expression. Um, we're going to put in numbers for this expression and look at and do some sample calculations with it to make sure that we know how to use it. Um, but for now, I'll just point out that these quantities, the Vs, are all velocities. So if the object's moving to the right in the ground frame, that's a positive velocity. If the ball is moving to the left in the train frame, that's a negative VBT. So we have to pay attention to the sign of these terms. Okay, But this is it. This is our final equation and our final expression for relativistic velocity addition. And it looks a whole lot like non-relativistic addition, but with a correction term in the denominator that prevents us from exceeding the speed of light. Okay, this has been a long one. We've done a long derivation using numbers and then again using symbols. Keeping things straight was probably not so, not so straightforward, but we finally got there. And look to the other video for examples of how to actually make use of this equation. All right, until next time.
Take care and be well.